introduction to part one of this series ended with me sketching on the pavements of France. After the French canals, we set sail for the little-known waterways of Southern Ireland. In contrast to our barge, for a year we lived aboard a small sailing boat. The story of the voyage is told in my book, A Voyage into Ireland. With the proceeds from the sale of the barge, we purchased a village school in the heart of the Kilkenny countryside. We lived in one classroom, and the other served as my studio. For a diversion, we loaded our camping gear and my sketch pack onto an old pram and spent a summer walking the byways of Ireland. The boots that tramped the byways of Ireland are the subject of this painting. And for a still life painting, a pair of boots serves just as well as a bowl of fruit. Vincent van Gogh's boots featured in many of his paintings. With the advent of photography, artists were free to go beyond making a precise likeness. Paul Cezanne's fruits are in a different category to the detailed still life paintings of the 16th and 17th century. And Pablo Picasso's still life paintings are different again. The subject of a still life need not necessarily be a carefully arranged composition. This is a painting of bread nuts that my wife had brought in from the garden, and they are wrapped in a leaf from the tree. The confusion of the composition invited me to run riot with line and colour. Old machinery is another of my favourite subjects, and this two-minute sketch is of a bowl of flowers. It is the size of a postcard and was made with a ballpoint pen. The painting that follows is of the same bowl of fruit that I used for the line drawing in part one of this series. But this time I'm working in watercolour. My colours come in tubes. I don't have time to pick up colour from the tiny pans that come in a paint box. My brush is a number 12 sable. I often use paper straight from a sketch pad. I get nervous before an expensive sheet of watercolour paper. With a sheet that has only cost a few cents, I've nothing to lose in taking a chance. I never stretch paper. At the speed I work, it doesn't have time to bottle. I have no rules for mixing colours. And I don't need a colour wheel to tell me what goes with what. When working from life, all the information I need is right there before my eyes. The leftover wash of one colour is often the ingredient for the next. With a loaded brush, I throw down a wash. Timing is then crucial for the subtle effect of one colour interacting with another, not on the palette, but right there on the page. At best, a watercolour is an accident waiting to happen. But you can clarify that by saying, the better the artist, the more often the accident works in his favour. Furthermore, there is truth in the saying, that a watercolour can't go right until it has gone wrong. In these videos, I have kept in mind the word of caution expressed by the poet Dylan Thomas, that being, somebody's boring me, and I think it's me. There are enough boring instructional painting videos without me adding to the list. One such video advises measuring the components of a still life with a ruler and then carefully transferring the measurements to the paper. Lectures might give an art student technical ability, but without passion, there will be no gain. I have no magic formula. All I can do is encourage the creative talent that lies within you. Painting in watercolour is not for the timid. Contrary to popular perception, there is nothing refined and dainty about it. It takes courage to give a wash the freedom it deserves. Washes have a mind of their own. The bolder they are applied, the more daring they respond. Watercolours are best when painted from life and thrown down in the heat of the moment. A painting that takes longer than 30 minutes is invariably a failure. The painter Charles Hawthorne advised his students to yell at me with colour, 
Washes that seem bold when first thrown down on paper appear insipid when dry. It is necessary to apply more colour than you dare and then add some more. I have learnt not to labour over a painting once the original intention has been lost. Better to put it aside and start afresh. I have also learnt to resist destroying work that, at the time, I perceived to be a failure. With the benefit of hindsight, a rejected painting is sometimes found to have merit. More often than not, the initial dissatisfaction is due to the impossibility of capturing the full force of nature. That which goes down on paper appears to be but a shadow of the real thing. It is only when viewed in retrospect that some spark of reality is seen to remain. Still life gives you the opportunity to experiment. It is not so much the subject, but what you make of it. The painting is now finished. To add more would be less. And if you have difficulty accepting my loose way of working, at least it can be said that my paintings are not just like a photograph. I side with Vincent van Gogh when he wrote, to learn to make those very inaccuracies, those deviations, remodeling, changes in reality, that they become, yes, lies if you like, but truer than the literal truth. <laughs>